<clears throat> Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video we're going to discuss what is normally never discussed on the mainstream media or with my beat shoot uh, content provider cohorts. You won't see the kind of content we're going to discuss right now anywhere but right here. So I suggest you get an adult beverage, fasten your seatbelt, and uh, hang on for dear life because you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. But uh, that's okay. You know, and for all my trolls out there, all my sissy boy trolls uh, that are either in denial or are paid by the clandestine services to attempt to discourage me, go F yourself, okay? You're going to really be disturbed when I start discussing the story. It's a true story, as all my stories are. My stories are based on reality, fact-based, and um, I, I always crack up when people uh, occasionally, you know, probably bots, chime in to ask me, what are my sources? What are my sources? I mean, obviously, it's secret file number 462, secret file number 22. That's my favorite. Uh, don't forget secret file 33 and 666. And of course, 999 North Rodeo Gulch uh, Road. That's my most favorite Frank Lloyd Wright felony arson blaze secret file 999 North Rodeo Gulch Road. Yeah, sure. Or how about 10050 Cielo Drive? Really, Bella, off Cielo Drive. Yeah, Cielo Drive off Cielo Drive. Or the Natalie Wood gated compound, 7708 Woodrow Wilson Drive off Woodrow Wilson Drive. That's a secret file there, right? Mm -hmm. Cass Elliott lived there while she was murdered in London in close proximity to Green Park in close proximity to the Playboy Club in London, Chelsea, in close proximity to the Grand Sheridan Hotel, right across the street from Green Park, right across the bridge from British Intelligence, walking distance, about a mile. It's about a mile walk to British Intelligence, you know, 007, James Bond, right there, central London, west London. It's where Judy Garland got killed. That's where Roberto Calfi got hung at the end of an orange rope with a love knot with a fake passport in his pocket. It didn't read Roberto Calfi. It read Gianni Calvini. Gianni Calvini. Walking distance to the Tavistock Institute from the Blackfriars Bridge. Scaffolding where he was hung. Obviously, he needed a boat and a crew to position him there with his 13 pounds of cement bricks in his pockets. So when people ask me, what are my sources? I have to tell you, it's the secret files. It's called, why don't you do your own research? Or better yet, why don't you have a life where you go outside of your little cubicle and you go meet people who work at corporations, who work at charities, endowment funds, people who work at banks, people who uh, go to private clubs, private societies, go mingle, go mix, see what you can find out, hang out at some of those Ivy League schools or at those clandestine University of California school system campuses and get to know people. You'll be amazed what kind of intel you can collect. All right. So needless to say, I've lived a charmed life and uh, I've been able to look through some portholes, portholes, windows. Oh, a porthole is a window on a ship. They generally do not open. They do not open. There are windows that do not open. We're under maritime admiralty law. We do not have windows that open. However, if you clean them, you can see through them. You can peer through and see some truth because there is no higher authority. There is no greater good than the truth. I understand that most people despise the truth. It makes them uncomfortable. They don't like that. They prefer delusion and the matrix, the comfort of the matrix, their creature comforts while they shelter in place and live in a gilded cage. In other words, they're living in a county jail, but with some really nice furnishings, unlike the county jail, which is mostly concrete and windowless. All right. Who 
we tend to focus on is the fake news people. They're the ones that brought us Charlie Manson, and then we found, oh, that's not really his name. It's Charlie Miles Maddox. In fact, when you look into every nationally presented story, like the Vietnam War, or anything that Walter Cronkite uttered, like the Apollo program, or, 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 you look at the stories Rachel Maddow did, Rachel Maddow outed as a lesbian, presumably at Stanford University as a freshman, when you look into the fact that she lists herself as an actor and you wonder why are you, am I taking you seriously as a news presenter if you're an actor? Well, it's the same reason people voted for Ronald Reagan, who was a professional actor and professional shill for General Electric and a professional paid informant for the FBI slash CIA or OSS, mostly CIA, um, during his time as Screen Actors Guild's president, it was CIA, FBI. And the reason is because people fall for the potato in the tailpipe. They always fall for that. But anyway, that's kind of the genesis of my channel has been stories where we were MK Ultra punked because what was presented in the newspapers and on television and through the CBS Masonic Evil Eye, Walter Cronkite, were always false. They were always untrue. That uh, they were there were elements that were true, but the context was always wrong, and we never got all the facts. And our questions were never answered. Our questions were never answered on 9/11. They were never fully answered about Pearl Harbor. They never got answered on the Sharon Tate murder. They never got answered on the Dr. Victor Oda family massacre. They never got answered on the Zodiac killings. They never got fully answered on the Son of Sam killings up there in. Uh, Queens and, you know, near Columbia University and parts of Pelican Bay area. And um, we just still have questions there on uh, Son of Sam. And we have questions about John Lennon and Mark Chapman and who is Jose Perdomo and did he kill John Lennon? And we have questions about where did Jose Menendez come from? He didn't come from under a rock, right? And did his really, did his two boys murder him? Really? Really? You think? You see that a lot? You see a lot of children shotgunning your parents in your neighborhood? Is that kind of a common occurrence? You see a lot of 21-year-old uh, girls like Susan Atkins with a nine-month-old child going around with an M7 bayonet trying to figure out how to get it out of the sheath, the holster. You see a lot of 21-year-old women who've been babysitting for the last year have a nine-month-old baby boy going around chasing people around property with a bayonet. Is that rather common? That's impossible. It never has happened in the history of the world. It has never happened except on television and in newspapers and in fake books produced by fake authors, waiters, gossip colonists, phony frauds, people that you should never in a million years believe anything that they type up that's approved by the clandestine services. All right, so let's get into my story today after my eight minute rant and tirade about the world of the meta matrix that Aaron Valente told us. It's all a game, it's a thought experiment. We're in the matrix. All right, let's get out of the matrix for a second because I'm happy to tell you that the matrix uh, has holes in it. There's holes in the fence line, the perimeter has weaknesses, they haven't buttoned up all their um, this is they probably never will. There's always flaws in every system. So unfortunately for the Matrix uh, managers, here I am with my channel. So let's discuss a person. I'm not going to say his name in deference to his family, who of course is in total denial about their beloved relative, who of course he's passed away so I can talk about him, right? And I knew this fellow for over 30 years. So don't tell me that I'm conjuring up a bunch of fantasies about this guy. I'm telling you the facts, okay? is a guy that was born in 1933, so that makes him approximately the same age as Diane Goldman Feinstein, the same age as Roman Polanski, the same age as uh, Jim Jones, the same age as, um, I'm trying to think who else is in that category. Yeah, a little older than Ken Kesey. Um, uh, anyway, so that just gives you some background, and he was born in California, and um, he was born in San Francisco, so, you know, Joe Aliotto was born in San Francisco, Diane Feinstein was born in San Francisco, 
Um, George Moscone was born in San Francisco, and he is really within that peer group, okay? And he certainly did know those people. They all knew each other, okay? So when I talk about this person, I'm telling you that the polit politicians and the mayor and the city council members of San Francisco, clandestine CI San Francisco, they all knew this person. However, you don't know this person. Nobody in the national uh, forum in the United States of America knows this person, but I do. And this person that I'm going to tell you about is about 10,000 times more important than George Schultz or Casper Weinberger or um, Ronald Reagan or um, Ron DeSantis or Gavin Newsom or Nancy Pelosi, Nancy DeLosandro Pelosi or Paul Pelosi, private banker, secret banker, Paul Pelosi. He is in the category of Enos Mejia. I would say that he is on par with Enos Mejia, who is the mother of Abigail Folger. And he knew Enos Mejia, who lived in Pacific Heights, San Francisco. You know, she was married to Peter Folger, who lived in Portola Valley, which is close to Sand Hill Road, where all those secret private bank venture capital firms were set up near Stanford University. Anyway, this person was born in 1933. I'm not going to tell you his name. Anyway, I'm going to say that uh, his parents were plugged in. They were part of a land trust. And if you drill back far enough, you have to see that these land trusts emanated from the Mexican-American wars where the Spanish land grants for Alta California were re... You had to reapply for your land grant. They were all suspended when the so-called you know Union Army won the war. And then um, you had to reapply to see if you could get some of that California real estate. So, so around the time after the, the Mexican-American Wars, um, which is before the Spanish-American Wars for all you, you know, historians out there, Spanish-American Wars was 1898. It's a four-month war. And the Mexican-American Wars, I don't know, 18, you know, around the gold rush time, 1840, something like that. Anyway, the land grants uh, fell in this person's direction as part of the Santa Margarita Trust. Now, it's confusing as heck because Santa Margarita Trust is essentially in Orange County up on the mountain. It encompasses cities you've known like Laguna, Laguna, Laguna Beach. Uh, it encompasses Tor El Toro, El Toro Canyon which became a United States um, Marine error field where Lee Oswald was stationed for a while. It encompasses Trabuco Canyon. It, uh, it, there is a town of Santa Margarita, Ladera Ranch. It goes down to San Clemente, Mission Viejo. Uh, El, what was Richard Nixon lived in San Clemente. It encompasses that. It encompasses all of the uh, state park property on the ocean line down to the United States Navy Marine Camp Pendleton to Oceanside, out to Vista where Lena LaBianca was purchasing a horse farm. Now, if you valued that property today, in today's money, I don't know, that's like $2 trillion. $2 trillion. It would be worth more than Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos' ex-wife and Larry Ellison and, and uh, Paul Allen and um, Steve Ballmer, take all them, add them all up, multiply times 10, and you get close to what this one family would be worth, okay? It's in the preposterous area where you never have to worry about money and you don't need to do a, a bank reconciliation. And yes, cattle ranching is an integral part of these properties, people, as well as renting them out to the military industrial complex, you know, to the United States Navy, to the Air Force, to the Army, to uh, NATO forces and, of course, collecting unlimited rents for hundreds of years. Just to give you a background, you know, he's a child of a land trust in the way that Enos Mejia was a daughter of a land trust. Her parents had a land trust in, in um, San Salvador. That's, and her parents were, of course, ambassadors to El Salvador in the embassy in San Francisco. Although they they lived in Piedmont, California in the East Bay, 
that because of the uh, 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, that's the main reason I think they relocated to um, the Oakland Hills. It's so funny to me, uh, having grown up in Oakland, that the people cling on to the concept that they live in Piedmont. They live in Oakland, but they want to cling on to their enclave. It's an enclave with sidewalks. It's the only enclave I know that actually has sidewalks. Piedmont, California. That's home to Enos Mejia, and it's home to to uh, Robert S. McNamara. And the reason we call him S is because he doesn't want you to know his name is Strange. It's Robert Strange McNamara, who went to University of California, Berkeley, Harvard MBA program. Um, then he went to um, Ford as a you know brainchild, and then later Department of Defense under the John Kennedy administration, and then oversaw the Vietnam War under LBJ Lyndon Baines Johnson. What a scam. Anyway, so this person, um, he went to a, a course affiliated with the Sacred Heart Order. Um, he uh, went to parochial school at Sacred Heart. That's a military um, indoctrination center, if you don't know. If you don't understand the origins of the Sacred Heart Order, you don't understand the French Revolution. That's There would never be a Sacred Heart Order without the French Revolution. It started in northern France, and it was started specifically as a counterintelligence agency using nuns with daggers. They carried daggers, the nuns. You trust, you trust your priest, you trust your nun, nun at your own peril. I learned that as a child. You never trust a nun. Never. They will sell you out. They're intelligence officers. Whether they even know it or not, they take an oath of obedience, an oath of chastity, and an oath of poverty, which makes them like synonym slaves. They're surveillance slaves. And this knucklehead was indoctrinated by the Sacred Heart Order. He then attended the Thatcher School in Ojai Valley, California. There are at least three clandestine service indoctrination private schools in Ojai. Ojai is north of Los Angeles. It's in Ventura County. Um, Santa Barbara, Ventura County come together where the Thatcher School is located. And you should know that um, I'm going to circle back to the schools there. The, the three schools that I'm referring to in Ojai, which is often referred to as an art colony, is the Happy Valley School, which also goes by the name Bessent Hill School which is a Freemasonry established school in 1946, founded in 1946, the Bessent Hill School. It's named after uh, the Bessent family, which has Mace, Freemason affiliations from London, England. And what do you know, we have a school in Ojai in 1946, college preparatory, 9th through 12th grade. And it is about a mile away from the Thatcher School. The Thatcher School was the first school the Thatcher School was uh, founded in 18, let's see, 1889. It was a boys only school. All these schools were boys only until like the 1970s. Around 1976, they went co ed, including the Sacred Heart Academy. They went co ed also. And um, initially, I think they were all girls' schools, like when Diane Goldman Feinstein, a Jewish girl, attended the Sacred Heart Academy in Pacific Heights at 2222, 2222 Broadway, four blocks from the infamous Paul Pelosi fake hammer attack. Can't make this stuff up, people. I mean, I guess I could. It's just I'm not an actor, so I don't have a Screen Actors Guild card, so I just got to tell you the truth. All right. Anyway, the other school, we got the Thatcher School. We got the... Um, we got the uh, what's called the Happy Valley School, aka, aka um, Basant Hill School. Basant, you should know, means gold coin. Gold coin. It's the gold coin school. The gold coin Hill School, Basant, for all you um, bankers out there. They only have 100 students for 9th through 12th. That means an average class size of 25. They boast that they have an average class size of 11, so perhaps they have two classes for each grade. Then we have the Mother of Divine Grace School. So those are the three schools. 
Thatcher School, Happy Valley School, Mother of Divine Grace, all in Ojai, a town which I vaguely know, but I've been there many times without knowing everything about it. It's like everything, the CIA hiding in plain view and you don't notice. All right, well, this person that I'm talking about, he's a scion. He was born from scion parents, and he is living on a land trust, and he doesn't ever have to work for the rest of his life. But he does. He does work. Um, he works modestly. He doesn't kill himself. He doesn't break his neck or anything like that. Why would you need to? Anyway, he graduated from the Thatcher School in Ojai in 1951. And he rode his horse. At the Thatcher School, one of the requirements is that all the students are to care and ride a horse. They're assigned a horse and they ride and care for that horse during their four years at the Thatcher pre-college prep school, which is what the Thatcher School is. It was created by a Yale um, University alumni. So the Thatcher School came out of Yale which I think is the oldest university in the United States of America. Anyway, Thatcher School is basically an extension of Yale University. And when I tell you who graduated from the Thatcher School, maybe that'll help you understand what I'm talking about when I say it's an indoctrination school for the CIA and the banks. And the reason that I say that is because it is. You know, their mascot is the toad, but their school um, symbol is the Pegasus, which is the winged horse. Remember, they're all about horses. And so what's comical about the school is that uh, they're really all about the toad. And I think that's honest. I really do think that's honest. Their, um, their symbol is the Pegasus, but the mascot is the toad. If you want to know who went to the Thatcher School, you should know Riley P. Bechtel did. He was one of the, he was the president of the Bechtel Construction Company. That's a clandestine service construction company, international, all around the world. Wherever the CIA goes, Bechtel goes, because Bechtel is part of that apparatus. Then you should know that, uh, you know, who else here that is notable that you'll recognize? It's a whole series of very famous people. Um, Howard Hughes, perhaps you've heard of Howard Hughes. He went to the Thatcher School. <laughs> he enrolled when he and his parents moved to California. Uh, and he was still at the Thatcher School when Howard Hughes' mother died. He was attending the Thatcher School. We have Roger Kent. He was a naval officer and political advisor. I was like, sort of like Ron DeSantis, right? I like it when they mix Navy intelligence with political applied linguistics poppycock. And you'll see that a lot with these uh, Yale uh, and um, Harvard and Thatcher School and Stanford University. They like to mix um, anthropology with intel. That's how you herd the sheep. That's how you herd the sheep, through applied linguistics, using people who have memorized and repeated really well. Roger Kent, naval officer and political advisor. Sherman Kent, intelligence analyst. Got to believe Sherman Kent and Roger Kent are probably related, don't you think? Then you have uh, Dr. Andrew Keeley, Kille, Dr. Andrew Kille, who's a writer, he's a teacher, and he's a scholar of psychological biblical criticism. Sounds like anthropology. All right, then you have um, John Klossner, is a screenwriter and director of Day Night, Shrek Forever, and Wonderland, Hollywood CIA. Michael E. Knight, he's an actor from All My Children. Perhaps some of you know him. I don't. You have uh, J.P. Mannix. He is an actor. He played Aaron Stone. You have um, Wheeler J. North, who is a marine biologist. You have Leland Orser, who's an actor in the movie Taken. You have Clay Pell. Jolie Richardson, who's an actress in later years. I can go on and on. There's a lot of luminary people here. All right. Anyway, that's the Thatcher School. My, uh, my friend graduated there in 1951. What happened next? Let me tell you. After he graduated from the Thatcher School, of course, he then... Uh, 
entered uh, Stanford University, of course, right? So he went to Stanford for his undergraduate. And then um, he then joined, I believe it was ROTC, United States Navy, non-commissioned officer following his graduation from Stanford University. And then he spent the next 10 years, which is going to go from 1955 until 1965. He then was integrated into the Vietnam War and was promoted to the rank of lieutenant commander. So he had a 10-year affiliation with Navy training, Office of Navy Intelligence, and he was then assigned to the USS Savage in the Mekong Delta, which is a destroyer like the Maddox. Remember, we had the Jim Morrison, his father, George Morrison, was the uh, rear admiral in charge of the entire fleet of the Bay of Tonkin, which included the USS Maddox. Well, my guy was on the USS Savage over at the Mekong Delta, which is in a different zip code than the Bay of Tonkin. This is the southern part of Vietnam, the 47 provinces that the media tells us it's the Viet, it's Vietnam, as if it's a country. It's not. It's just a, it's just a provisional property of Indonesia is what it is. Anyway, um, there's a lot of psychological false narratives involved with the Vietnam War, and I'm going to get to that in a second, which uh, really is like a 45-year colonial terrorism experiment. It's probably more like 100 years. Um, perhaps longer than a hundred years, but I'm just going to pick up from 1965 when our man was assigned to the USS Savage. He is now a lieutenant commander, and um, he's involved with the Ming Kong Delta during the Vietnam War. And um, after, you know, I'm going to zip back in a second. He then, after being discharged from the Navy, he went to the Santa Clara Jesuit University where he received his law degree, so now he's a lawyer. And then he worked at one of the big corporations that had uh, headquarters in San Francisco. And he is a badass. I mean, he is a badass based on the fact that he's a lieutenant commander from the United States Navy. He worked during the Vietnam War, which is a clandestine services operation all the way. He's a part of clandestine services with Navy intelligence. And he is now a senior lawyer at a big corporation in San Francisco. I won't mention the name. Of course, yes, he was a member of all the clubs that you, some of you have heard of and some of you haven't. The Bohemian Club, yes. The Pacific Union Club at the top of Knob Hill, across the street from the Fairmont Hotel, across the street from the Masonic Auditorium. Yes, he was a member in good standing of the Pacific Union Club. He was also a member of the University Club, which is beside the next door to the um, Fairmont Hotel, which is on California Street. Um, this is all walking distance to the Bohemian Clubhouse, which is on Taylor Street. It's down a steep hill, so most people don't like to walk because it wrecks your shoes. It's so, I mean, it's really steep. Taylor Street is very steep on both sides of California of California Street. Anyway, he was also a member of the Knights of Malta. Now, that's important, people, because Lino LaBianca was too. Lino LaBianca's uh, brother-in-law, Peter DeSantis, he was the, not only was he a member of the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus, but he was also the managing director for the West Coast operations of the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus. So what I'm telling you is that uh, Lino LaBianca indirectly would be a member of of a secret society, private society, of which my guy was also. And you shouldn't be surprised that Lino LaBianca got bayoneted 10 times to his chest. He was working for clandestine services, and sometimes clandestine service soldiers get whacked. Uh, my guy, of course, also, you know, when he was older, you know, he was in his 30s during the Vietnam War, and uh, he then sat on the board of trustees for the Thatcher School for many years. He was a member of the board of trustees and he was a member of a Catholic parish in San Francisco in close proximity to Haight-Ashbury. Um, I won't mention the name of the parish. It was different than St. Ignatius de Loyola, but it was close. And um, I spent a lot of time with this guy. He had residences at Lake Tahoe on the Nevada side, the tax exempt side of Lake Tahoe. He had residents in San Francisco in a expensive but not as well publicized area. So he's there, 
but he's sort of hiding in plain view. He's not in Pacific Heights. He's not in Presidio Heights. He's not in Seacliff. He certainly could have been. He certainly could have been. He could live anywhere he wants, anywhere on the planet Earth. He could live in Bellagio. He could live in Como. He could live in uh, Lugano, Switzerland. He could live in London, England. He could live in um, Shanghai, Hong Kong. He could live like a king anywhere he wanted to live. But he lived atop a, a, one of the highest places in San Francisco. I won't say where. He wasn't at the tippy top, but he was damn close to as high as you could get a home in San Francisco. He lived. And he had a tremendous view from his home. But it was an understated home. It wasn't a grand mansion. I'd been in the home. It was a lovely home. It was on a steep hillside. And it had a spectacular panoramic view. But it wasn't in one of those you know, Golden Gate Bridge view type homes. Um, although he had relatives that had those homes. So it's not like he didn't spend a lot of time in Pacific Heights. He did. He had a lot of friends that lived there. All right. He also had a cattle ranch in Central California. And his favorite uh, accomplishment after graduating from the Thatcher School was he rode his pony from Santa Margarita, which is near San Luis Obispo. It's near Paso Robles, if you know your California map, which has a Father Uniparis or a mission. Anyway, he rode from Santa Margarita up to Hollister, San Juan Batista, where Alfred Hitchcock filmed his movie Vertigo. That is a 182-mile pony ride. And I don't know how many days that took, but I don't think a horse can go more than 20, 25 miles a day. So you can do the math that that, you know, you're looking at a four or five, what are you looking at? Like a, no, you're looking at a eight to 10 day horse ride. That's going to be sore on your butt. Anyway, he did that. He did a, let's call it a 10 day horse adventure from Santa Margarita up to Hollister. That's some serious pony riding. You should know that William Randolph Hearst used to do that too, from the Hearst Castle over to Fort Hunter Liggett, which was Mission San Antonio, but is also rented. He rented the property of the United States Army. Fort Hunter Liggett is an army base, and it's on the Hearst Land Trust. See, people, wherever these people like William Randolph Hearst live, there's uh, military bases that are paying rent. That's part of the Land Trust Scion mystique. All right. Anyway, carrying on with my friend, um, it was he that introduced me to the Bohemian Club, whereupon I met George Schultz, Casper Weinberger. Um, that is where, whilst they were still, um, you know, big shots during the Ronald Reagan administration, and um, they were also Bechtel executives prior to being, you know, in the government, so-called. And then um, we had Phil Harris, who was CBS radio partner with Jack Benny. Met him. He was there. That's what kind of triggered my red pilling was why would Hollywood people like screenwriters for NBC, RCA, Victor, people that wrote the scripts for Jack Benny, people that wrote the, the material for the Johnny Carson Tonight Show, why were they at the Bohemian hijinks night? And the answer is because it's an integration of the clandestine services. Actors are a huge part of Spooksville. Actors, because everybody's playing a role. And you have to be able to look at the camera and lie. Bald face lying. Very important. Very important. I don't think my guy was that good of a liar, which is why he never appeared on camera. It's why I really, uh, you know, appreciate what he did for me. He opened my eyes. This is a window that he opened. He opened this porthole for me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this channel. Or I'd be doing this channel, but I'd be like everyone else on BitChute. I'd be like everybody else at uh, all these social media that are clueless. They have not seen the reality. Everything people talk about is on television or radio or newspapers. That's not who runs the show. The people that run the show never appear in public. I mean, they're in public, but you just think they're a hobo. You look around, you look, you, if you met this guy, you'd look right past him. Were it not for his bow tie and his ascot and his vest that he used to wear on holidays, he'd wear a vest and a bow tie. He looked like a college professor. He was like a mild-mannered college professor. This is a guy who's in Navy intelligence on a destroyer in the Ming Kong Delta. Let me read you a little bit about my contempt for the Vietnam so-called war. 
All right. Let me just read you this. <laughs> I got this from Government Book Talk. How Navy Intelligence Shaped the Vietnam War. I'm going to read it and then I'll comment on it. During the Vietnam War, United States Navy Intelligence, that's home to John Kennedy and home to Ron DeSantis. When I say Navy Intelligence, off you have Office of Navy Intelligence, ONI, acronym, three letters, ONI. During the Vietnam War, United States Navy intelligence was a very complex affair. Layers of political organization, military strategy, offensive tactics, and logistical operations shaded the struggle to win South Vietnam. Much of that portion of the Cold War era is now declassified. No, it's not. It's mostly classified. Illuminating the con contributions of the Office of Navy Intelligent Establishment. GPO makes available, that's government book talk, knowing the enemy, naval intelligence in Southeast Asia, part of the United States Department of Navy series of commentary studies on the Vietnam War. Officers and enlisted personnel gathered and analyzed credible intel on the movement of communist combat units and the location of the Viet Cong encampments and the flow of weapons and ammunitions along the Mi Cong Delta, the communications, electronic, human, and imagery intelligence they collected was, quote, a key to the operation and tactical success of naval forces in Vietnam, end quote. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. What success? Didn't we lose the war? Didn't we lose the war? I mean, the war was not won. So why would you declare it a success if it was a failure? What encampments are you talking about? You do know that the population of the Mekong Delta is mostly Roman Catholics that were repositioned from the Navy and the United States Airborne Airlift from Hanoi under the guise that the communists were going to kill all the Roman Catholics that were Jesuit educated. And they repositioned those people to the south by Saigon into the Mekong Delta. So what are you saying that the communists are Catholics? Well, perhaps they are. Maybe the communists are Catholics. But anyway, there was no success with respect to this Navy intelligence. And respect to the word credible intelligence, that's an oxymoron. There's no credible, there's no credible intelligence. It's all made up in a conference room. Members of the Navy intelligence community, that's what they call themselves, a community, that routinely engaged in intelligence collection often did their dangerous but vital work in direct contact with the enemy. What enemy? <laughs> the invisible enemy. For example, for example, photo reconnaissance pilots flew fast and furious into the oncoming aircraft fire, anti-aircraft fire, because they didn't have an air force. Vietnam didn't have a navy and they didn't have an air force. So, you know, you're fighting a war with a guy with a boomerang <laughs> and a rock. All right. And an, and an AK-47 with no bullets. All right. So we got uh, anti-aircraft fire for the best pictures. But they had the SR-71 spy plane that can fly at 100,000 feet, 16 miles up, and take crystal clear photographs. I don't think there's an anti-aircraft gun that can go that high. In fact, I know there isn't. Anyway, what they're saying is that they risked their lives to get photographs. But I'm here to tell you, they took the R, um, they took the F-4 fighter bomber, removed all the weapon systems, put cameras on it, and my friend flew that plane in Vietnam as a um, reconnaissance airplane, even though it was a fighter bomber. It's a fighter bomber aircraft, which was converted to surveillance. And he never got shot down. Then later he flew the SR-71 spy plane, which he threw sonic booms at people he wanted to terrorize. That doesn't sound like reconnaissance or intel either. Whatever. All right. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you is that the Navy Intelligence Office of ONI, they're engaged in the prisoner dilemma game. They're engaged in propaganda. They're engaged in creating targets and quotas to produce a simulated uh, war to torment these uh, innocent Indonesian people who are Buddhists. They're all Buddhists. The Roman Catholics are working for the CIA or the um, clandestine services, they're indoctrinated by the Jesuits, Society of Jesus. They're clandestine service warriors. And nothing could be more clear in, than, than that in my experience. Having dealt with Jesuits, my uncle was a Jesuit. 
think I don't know what I'm talking about? Fortunately, he impregnated some uh, young woman and was uh, had to resign. <laughs> he broke the oath of chastity. He didn't get whacked, but he did resign. All right. So let me summarize here. What does it all mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that the people who run our world, which is the matrix, as Aaron Valente calls it, um, they do not appear on television. They do not appear on the cover of books or magazines. They're not in time life. They're not discussed. Um, people like Rachel Maddow would never be allowed anywhere near him. Plus, I think she's a woman, so she would never be allowed at the cremation of care ceremony at the Bohemian Grove, nor at the Bohemian Club. Dianne Feinstein would, of course, not be permitted into the inner sanctum of these activities, which would occur at the Masonic Lodges and in secret conference rooms or at the Pacific Union Club or one of these private societies or in the basement uh, where you have hijinks night and all manner of um, professionally prepared scripted events. That's my point for today, people. I hope you enjoyed my story. You're not going to hear this anywhere else. Please hit the like and subscribe, and we'll talk soon. Take care.